It takes all of us together. See, this ministry is not about white people. It's not about black people. It's not about Korean people. It's not about broken people. It's not about lost people. It's not about righteous people. It's not about holy people. It's not the perfect people. See, this house is built on the Lamb of God. This house is built upon the truth of the one true God. And so when we come together and we gather, we can joke around. We can have fun. Because that's what church should be. It should be an opportunity for you to come. There's times you have to be serious. But there's also times you can come and have fun. And I can at times can be a person that can have fun. Sometimes Denise will have to rein me in because I try to have too much fun. And um, so, well, first and foremost, I'm honored to be, be here be before you to be able to come and be entrusted with the pulpit, to be able to speak and release what Holy Spirit has given, given, Korean, given me. <laughs> hey, let me tell you, when I teach my history class, they crack jokes on me all the time. Say that one more time, Mr. Whitecart. You're just trying to make fun of me now. So forgive me. But the truth of the matter is I am honored. I am blessed to be here. And uh, I don't, when I come before his people, when I stand before his people, his church, and the man of God that has allowed me to be standing here today, I don't take it lightly. I was sharing with the brother before service started. I said, you know, I am a little nervous. But the nerves or the, anx- the anxiousness, per se, or, you know, how you, it's not out of a bad place. It's a place to kind of give you energy and to give you the ability to do what you're called to do. And so when I stand here, I realize the gravity of being able to stand in this place, to be a voice. And so I honor Steve Parker, the visionary of this house, the head minister of this house, and for him trusting me to come before his flock, his people, his children, to speak. And so I hope and pray that you will receive everything that Holy Spirit is going to release through me today. So can I get an amen this morning? You know, that whole fear thing I was sharing with him, I said, uh, you know, uh, I learned a long time ago from an old paratrooper infantry guy. We were standing, sitting around, and some of you guys that are in the military understand what I'm talking about. If you don't, know, those are the guys that jump out of airplanes and go kick down doors and shoots a lot of things. And, and we remember as a young 18, 19-year-old kid, I'm sitting there talking to him, uh, one of my platoon sergeants, and we're sitting there, and this guy has seen it all, done it all. And we're sitting there, and we're like, hey, does it ever get to a place where you're not scared anymore to jump out of the plane? Does you ever get a place where you're not scared to go and do this, do that, do whatever? And I remember him looking at all of us as serious. He got so quiet. You could hear a, literally a pin drop. And he said to us, he said, son, you ever get to a place that you're not scared, you need to find another occupation. Not because you're fearful in the sense of, ah, you know, a horror movie, but more so. Because it puts you in perspective to prepare you for what you're about to encounter. And so what it does is it focuses you. It enables you to do the mission. And so as we as believers today, there's something stirring in me. And I just want to release because I don't want to let him down. Or that man that sits right there down today. And I definitely don't want to let you guys down. So amen. Amen. The title of today's message is called Battle Buddies. Battle bu- buddies. Not about the dogs. Some of y'all got it. <laughs> Remember the dogs about the, the golden retrievers? Ah, never mind. Bad joke. My bad. My bad. I thought that would go good. I'm sorry. Um, battle buddies. Because of my, my experience, I can only speak from what I come from. And so I'm going to share from my heart what is in me and how God used things in my life to share with you guys. So one of the things that he showed me a long time ago, and he taught me in a very precarious situation back in 1986, he taught us a term, taught me a term called battle buddy. Anybody in here serving in the military? Do you know what battle buddies are? Well, Air Force don't. Uh, Yeah. Just throwing that out there. Just think. No, no. 
But I remember learning the term battle buddy. And anywhere and everywhere you had to go, you had to have your battle buddy. And you better not show up somewhere without your. God forbid. (laughs) You don't show up. I mean, you show up and your battle buddy's not with you. God forbid your buddy shows up and he's not squared away. God forbid you show up and you're trying to do a task and your old battle buddy don't know what he's doing. My point is this. Battle buddy is a military term for accountability. Accountability. I remember a long time ago when I was, in, like I said, in 1986 going to basic training. And one of the things that, to me, military life is very similar to the kingdom. Because a lot of the principles are very similar. There's a renewing. There's a dying to old self and becoming a new creation. Come on now. Ooh, that'll preach right there. There's some things right there that happens that goes on. Now, some receive it and go on, and there's some that fights it. Oh, some of y'all know who I'm talking about. But that's the same thing in the kingdom. And so I know back in 1986, I remember as a, uh, I had a full head of hair and a mullet. And I remember showing up. I know, picture that. (laughs) I know. It was down to here. And I remember showing up. 17 years old. At boot camp or MEPS. And then, you know, I knew they're going to cut my hair. And I remember sitting there, and that to me was the first step of dying to the old self and becoming this new man in the military. And they began, took that razor, and they never go on the side. They never go like, whoop, 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 you know, real nice and everything else. They get scissors out and trim, trim, trim. No, 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 no. They just go right there in the front and whoop. And if they miss, like the front part, we had a few guys, that front part right here, they kind of were a little bit back. And so through boot camp, they had this little thing that was sneaking out like this. <laughs> they had nicknames. They, we gave them nicknames, but we're in church. All right. And they begin to shave your head. And you, I remember sitting there. I remember going to the bathroom. And I looked in the mirror. And I'm like, what did I do? What did I sign up for? And that was the first time I recognized change is about to come. Change is about to come. Over the last few weeks, I have, well, I probably shouldn't say a few weeks. because probably a couple months now. Uh, a question was posed. In this at church, do you know your resources? Do you know your resources? I remember we were at friends and family, and and uh, Miss Kaylee mentioned and asked the question about, "Do you know your resources?" And she was talking about not so much your checkbook, your car, your house, your job. She was talking about spiritually. Who are your resources in this room? Who is the resources in this place? And so it began a journey for me to sit there and take a step back and go, who are my resources? And not so much who are my resources, but who am I a resource to? Because see, in the kingdom, it's not a take thing. It's a give and receive process. And so I sat there and I said, Father, who am I a resource to? I'm not talking of in the natural places because there's natural things. I can go around this room. Some of you got some amazing gifts and talents. And, yes, those are resources that can be used. But they are spiritual aspects of who you are that people in this ministry need. And so it began to stir in my heart what in me can be a resource for others. And so that began to stir, and then we started this land project, or building project, rather, on the land. And it, again, when you start building something, what do you need? Resources. And in the natural, you need money, you need 
building material, you need contractors, you need all these different people of all kind of different natural things, but by the Spirit as we build this building, what resources are available here to help build that building? Because see, that building is not the church, we are. That's just a place for us to gather and come together. That building is not the school, it's what goes on in the classroom that's the school. And so I sat there and I said, Father, what are the resources? Who are the resources that, come, that is available in this ministry? There are resources out all over this community. I know, I know with every fiber in me that God has called to bring, them, bring their fanny here. Because there are resources they have there's a prophetic word they need to release. There is faith that they need, to, they need to walk by. There is something, and we as a people need to draw that out of the community, but out of one another. And so all these things started stirring, and I, I can talk about this for a while, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to get the hand wave from James in the back. <laughs> so I sat here, and I was looking at this, and I was going through, and I was sitting there going, okay, resources, resources resources and then I started to realize in my own life there's resources in me sometimes I don't want to let go in fact I shared a resource I didn't want to fully worship because I was holding on to the seat in front of me see there's a, that's a resource a spirit of worship a spirit of praise that's a resource and so he gave me something in Ephesians 6, 12, we all know. And that's a, we battle against not flesh and blood. We do not battle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers of a dark world. That is what we battle. And do you not believe that they do not want nothing more? than for you to not release your resource. To release what's in you to the people you're joined to. Are you willing to allow a voice or a person or a situation to limit your ability to walk by the Spirit and release what the Spirit has given you in order to build? Again, it's not about building a building, but building His kingdom. And too often we get lost in his place. And so he came to me to, this week when I was asked, that, Tom, hey, man, are you willing to release this week? I said, yes, sir. Because I'm going to share with you what he's been sharing with me. And that is, are you accountable for what is in you? Or are you releasing that? And who are your battle buddies in your life? Wait, stop right now. Let's look at it naturally. Stop right now in this room. If you've been part of this ministry for any length of time, something happened, good, bad, or ugly, doesn't matter. Good times, bad times, ugly times. Right now in this room, who's your resource? Who's your battle buddy? Who are you going to? Who are you going to talk to? I love this. There was a saying about uh, being, a lo- being a wolf. And I read this, and it just hit home this week. It says, do not proclaim a desire to be a lone wolf, but get upset when you do not have a pack. Oh, let me say that one more time. Some of y'all, that's all you're going to remember when you walk out of here. Because, see, a lone wolf will die, but a pack will survive. We're not called to be lone wolves. See, some of y'all are like, I walk with God. I'm good. I hear Holy Spirit for myself. No, Holy Spirit telling your brother over here, your battle buddy, to get in your face and say, where were you at core? Why weren't you at church on a Sunday morning? We need everybody in here. Well, I'm not preaching. It don't matter. You're not called to preach. You're called to be here. Oh, come on now. Woo. That one in my notes. I, I, that was for somebody. Amen. That one in my notes. I promise. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. But the thing is, is what we have to realize, you got to have battle buddies in your life. My wife, man, I love her to death. Obviously, 33 years of marriage. I better love her. <laughs> Sunday comes. There's people that she has battle buddies with. And if she doesn't see you here, where you been? What's going on? Not to punish. Not to condemn. Not to play a guilt trip. It's about, hey, I need you. Battle buddy, I need you. I can't show up by myself. I need my people with me. I don't want to be a lone wolf. I need my pack here. Some of y'all want to be alone. And God will meet you right there. But today, he's giving you some freedom. He's telling you right now, no longer should you be alone. And this is the thing. Don't be sitting there saying, oh, my pack, my boys. No, your boys are wrong people to be packed up with. Some of y'all hanging out with your boys back on the street. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to go right where they're going. Who you hang out with becomes you. And so I encourage you today. Woo. I haven't even got, I'm, I'm still in the intro, guys. I may have to come back, may ask Steve to. <laughs> so why does battle buddies mean so much? Because in the army, guess what? Your battle buddy got your six. They pick up the slack when you can't carry it anymore. When you're on a ruck march and you got to be there and you got three hours and you know you got to get to where you got to go and you can't carry it anymore, you're like, bro, can you carry my ammo? I got you. Let's do this together. And then what you start realizing is that's not your battle buddy, but it's all these other buddies. Now you got a squad. Now you got a platoon. Now you got a company. You're out there on a move and you're like, I can't do this anymore. He goes, son, I got you. And you're like, I don't know who you are, but you got me. There's some of y'all in here, I don't know, but a day will come, I'm going to need you. And there's going to be a day when you're going to need me. We're in this together, folks. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, if you have your Bibles, turn there. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their toll. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. What was I talking about? But woe to him who is alone. When he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together and they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who was alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly bro broken. If two can withstand one, how many can five withstand? How many can ten withstand? How many can 200 withstand? Can I get an amen this morning? What we have to realize, that's the kingdom. We call it family. We call it church. We call it whatever you want. But this is the truth. We are in this together because we are the sons of the one true living God, Yahweh God. And all of us, all of us walk together. I got a funny story about that. I keep them warm at night. <laughs> Debated with the Holy Spirit. Should I share this story or not? He says share it. I'm going to share it real quick. It was a cold December night. <laughs> We're out in the middle of, I don't know where. 18 years old. Cold. Wet. It was raining. Oh, let me tell you, you don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. Standing. In a foxhole, those that remember those things, you're standing in basically a hole in the ground. As it rains, you know, it's amazing. They say dirt absorbs water, you know, because it's, yeah. no, not on foxholes. <laughs> they seem to get higher and higher, and you're standing there. And you're getting wet, you're getting soaked, they give you a poncho. Eh, 
You ever wear a poncho? You get hot and you get uh, oh, I'm wet and I'm hot. Uh. Anyway, you're wearing this poncho, you're soaking wet and you're freezing. It's me and my battle buddy. I didn't like my battle buddy. I'm going to let that sink in because there's a principle to that. I don't like him. He don't like me. But we're in this hole together. He was assigned to me. I'm done. He was assigned to me. So we're in this hole together, wet, cold, miserable. One, two o'clock in the morning, I remember, because we got the short end of the stick, and we were like out in the middle of nowhere in the worst time of night, freezing. We get back to our hooch, and as we get there, and we lay, and it's a very small little space. If you're cold and wet, what do you do with your wet clothes? You take off your wet clothes. You don't want hyperthermia to set in. So they teach you this. Go take off your clothes, put on dry clothes. I'm laying there with the man I don't like. <laughs> we literally are back to back, touching. And I'm sitting there going, I am not about to take my clothes off and get changed. And he was saying, bro, I, bro, bro. <laughs> about 20 minutes went by. We couldn't go back to sleep. We're literally shivering. And I said, I almost said his name. I don't want to say his name. I said, bro, I don't care what you do. I'm about to get stripped. I got to get this stuff off me, man. And he goes, really? He goes, he said, I'm glad you, you thought of doing that because I'm about to take my clothes off too. <laughs> so we begin to remove our wet clothes. And we did everything we could not to <laughs> touch each other. <laughs> but I'm not going to lie. When his back touched my back, <laughs> I said, Jesus. And I didn't even know Jesus at the time. I just said, Lord, whoo, that's warm. <laughs> I just lay there and said, oh, oh. It was like God said, there's a little touch of heaven right there for you. Boom. And I thought he probably was thinking the same thing because he didn't move either. He just laid there. <laughs> so needless to say, we kept each other warm because this is the thing. If I was in there by myself, I could have changed by myself. But this is something that I really discovered while we're both in there. Two people in a hooch create a lot of body heat. It made it warmer with the two of us in there than if one was in there. The other thing I realized, it's hard to take off wet clothes laying on the ground. You need help. I can't get this over my shoulder. I can't. And he helped, and I helped him. And the power of that was we stayed warm. Ecclesiastics, it says, one that is alone will not stay warm. Dare say in the morning he'd be dead. But see, God assigned this man to me. Didn't matter if I liked him or not. Some of y'all, that's maybe all you needed here today. When you get up and walk out, you need to go, who are you assigned to me? I don't like him. He's like, too bad. Too bad. I got, okay, all right. I got you. It's not about liking people. It's about loving people. Woo! Oh, some of y'all. Josh, can I get an amen, brother? He's my brother from, we went to Africa together, so he understands. But see, when we sit there and recognize the value of people, family. See, my family, I was sharing on the way into church this morning with my, my brother Bola. And I can seriously say my brother, because by the Spirit, we are brothers. About my natural brother. I haven't talked to my natural brother in over a year. Last time I talked to him, he asked for money. I gave him the money. I never talked to him again. Don't be sad. That's life. That's the world. He's not joined to me. You guys say, oh, he's your brother. No. Blood is thicker. Not this blood. 
his blood. Oh, can I get an amen? amen? See, his blood's thicker. He's in his own community. He needs to look at his battle buddies or lack thereof. I'm in my community. You're my company. You're my battalion. You're my brigade. You're my military. You're my team. You're my battle buddy. And so I call out to you. I need a resource. I need you to be with me. I well, I don't want you in the tent with me, but <laughs> Denise can. All right. So what we have to do is come to this place to recognize the power, the power of having accountability with your battle buddy. So there's three things I want to, I know, we're like, oh, wait a minute, you've been talking. I'll be real quick. Three points I want you to recognize or understand before you leave here today about accountability, about battle buddies, that it creates. It creates in you. See, accountability, number one, creates a standard. Without accountability, there's no standard. Because what am I going to hold you accountable to? To my standard? Your standard? What you want, what I want? You go on and watch the news, that's what you see all over the world. Well, this is what we got. Oh, nope, they're wrong. This is what we got. They can't even hold each other accountable. Our government can't hold each other accountable. The world can't hold itself accountable. But we in the kingdom of God can. And the accountability is he is establishes the standard, not you or I, not Steve, not Kim, not Kaylee, not Tom, not James, not, not Matt. No one sets the standard but him. And again, I'll tell you about what his standards are. Are you holy? Are you righteous? Are you loving? Do you love him with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength? Do you love your brother, your neighbor, your battle buddy as much as you love yourself? There's nowhere in there talking about liking them. Nowhere in there talking about being best friends with them. But are you willing to love them? See, that's the standard. He, doesn't get, he gives us his word, and he did give rules at one time, 160, uh, 613 or 31 or something like that, at one time. To people and said, you buy by my standard. Here's my standard. Could they keep it? No. Christ had to come. And he set a new standard. The standard, the only standard you have to do is to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And everything else will come. Oh, see, some of y'all didn't hear me. Can I get an amen this morning? I need to hear something. I need to receive from you guys today. See, you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What he's now done. See, Yahweh sets the standard. Christ enables you to see and embrace the standard. And then Holy Spirit comes to enable you to maintain the standard. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? See, what we do so many times, we put God over here. and, and, and Look, one's at, one is him. One's access. Not taken away from who he is and what he's done. The other is the one that daily when you walk, he's the one that says, why are you going left? You should go right. I know you only got $100 in your bank, but you need to bless your battle buddy over here. You don't know what they're going through. See, it's a willingness within you to hear Holy Spirit. See, that's a standard. In Romans 14.10, it says, Why do you pass judgment on your brothers, brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an, a what? A what? Of himself or herself to God, to Yahweh. Every person in here, you will give your own account. But what he's done is he's given us tools. He's given us resources. Come on now. See, some of y'all, y'all need to hear this. 
get a hold of this. You've been given resources. There's a man every Sunday that he comes up here and he releases a word. This is a man that oversees this ministry. There's a man that stands and he prays over each and every one of you. The man that is faithful over what he has been given. He is faithful over the, all the things that the Father has given him. He has been doing the best. Was he, is he perfect? No. But he's going to give an account. He will give an account, but I can dare say I, I want to stand there when he does because I'm going to be like, yeah, he did a pretty good job there, sir. He was awesome. Because he was a battle buddy even when I didn't want a battle buddy. Oh, hey. Oh. Some of y'all. I didn't want a battle buddy. I didn't want to be accountable. But that's the call. And I'm not talking call of ministry. I'm talking about call. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is your call. Accountability creates a standard and enables you to embrace that standard. Next, trust. Accountability builds trust. Battle buddy. I have battle buddies that I have stayed in contact with for over 30 years. Guys that we have seen things, done things, been places. And because we had the same experiences together and we had each other's back. Were they perfect? No. Did they make mistakes? Yeah. Was I perfect? No. Did I make mistakes? Yeah. But we took care of each other. We t- made sure we both made it through whatever we're going through. Again, even in the good times, you need your battle, buddy. You got to be able to rejoice with who's rejoicing. And even in the tough times, your battle buddy is probably the one that's going to get you through. And so what it does is it creates this place of trust. In John 15, 13, many of you know this passage. It says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. See, in the army, we learned to, you got to lay your life down. Not because you want to sometimes, but you're willing to. Are you willing to lay your life down? See, some of y'all are going, I got mine, you get yours. That's not kingdom. He's called you to lay your life down for the fellow man next to you. Are you willing to do so? Because, see, when you start doing that, there's something that starts being created. And I share this all the time with people. I learned this a long time ago. Trust is created. And this trust looks like this, a bridge. When I, with Kaylee, we work together. She's my boss at the school. We develop trust. When we first met each other and things like that, there's a rope bridge that is built. Sometimes only one rope. It's good enough for you to get across, but it ain't very strong. Next thing I know, we got two more ropes across. Now we got a three-rope bridge. A lot easier to get across. In fact, you can, if you do it right, you don't even have to get wet. Come on now. It becomes stronger. And the next thing you know, you, now you got a pontoon bridge that's being built. Well, guess what? Now I can just walk across. I can now drive across. Now the back and forth. The trust goes back. It's stronger. And next thing you know, it turns into a concrete bridge. Takes a lot now to break that bridge down. You know, you got to really set a lot of stuff to kind of take that little place out. And in fact, when you do, you can't take the whole thing out, only a part. It makes it a lot easier to repair because now, if I'm over here and you're over there, there's a bridge. And now you got to steal bridge. Ooh. Not the one in Baltimore. I'm not talking about the one in Baltimore. I know it's a bad joke. I repent. Um, but you got a steel bridge. And it's that much stronger. But then then there's something that goes even beyond 
Those that have been married, that trust, I hope, can't be broken. Your children, there's a trust can't be broken. So when you become a battle buddy, if you're willing to lay your life down for me, I know our trust can't be broken because that's what Christ did for me. He laid his life down for me. Who am I not to lay my life down to my battle buddy? Can I get another amen? So for us today, when you start talking about trust, you get a standard, you get trust, you know you got the people, and you know they call you, they say something to you, you know they got your best interest in mind. And if they say something silly, you're like, hey, that's a little hit on the bridge, but we got a, we got a, we got a bridge that maybe you can try to hit it and bump it, but it ain't going to go away. Can I get an amen this morning? Because, see, this is the truth. The biggest enemy to bridges of trust is offense. Y'all heard that before. Bridges of offense. When you have trust, the biggest enemy to a bridge is offense. And sometimes the offense is not even the person. It's something inside yourself. And more times than not, it's in yourself. Did the person come slap you? No. Did he come and steal money from you? No. Did he kill somebody in your family? No. What did they do? They said this, that, the other. Okay. Well, let me go over here. Did they slap you? No. Did they kill somebody in your family? Did they rob you? Did they do any of those types of things? No. What did they do? They said something. No. So that's going to destroy. Is that going to destroy the trust that you had with a person? Are there times where those that trust can be really broken, but there's still some pillars there that the God of miracles can come back in. I'm a testimony to that today. See, that's what we have to recognize. And see, you hear me sit there and talk about having someone's six, having someone's back, and these types of things. These are just terms that in the military, when someone tells me they got my six, I ain't got to talk to you for two years. But I pick up that daggum phone. Bro, this is going on. Got you. Right now in your life, who you got like that? Who you got right now in your life that when you pick up the phone and say, I need you? I'm not talking about material things. There's all kinds of things the world can give you in material. I'm talking about spiritually as a person, as a man, as a woman, as who you are, the very fiber of the being that God created you to be. Who do you have? That you can pick up a phone and say, hey, I'm going through this. I need you. Well, I don't trust them. Well, you ain't got accountability. Maybe that's why you don't. That's why he's put you in that situation for you to develop and change. See, too often people sit there and they put me in a box because of their experience with another medical provider. See, I work in my, my full-time position is I'm a, I'm a nurse practitioner. I take care of a lot of different things. And it's the funniest thing. They come in there, and they expect me to treat them like other, other doctors treat them or other MPs treat them. I'm like, no, bro. This is my, you, I'm your battle buddy here. Don't put me in that box over here. So don't put in this man here as a pastor. Oh, that pastor over there did this. Man, I'm not going to church anymore. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I, oh the, you, you didn't know what these people did over here. Oh, that's why I'm not going to be a participant of that. Don't put people in a box. Set them free. Set yourself free. Set yourself free. Oh, all right. I'm going to share this last story. Or I got two stories. Two stories. And then we're going to begin to close. <laughs> Sir, I promise.
I'm going to share something very personal. The other day, one of the young ladies here came up to me and asked me, because I wear this bracelet a lot, and asked me, what's that bracelet? Innocent, an- innocent question. And I shared very briefly what this bracelet represents to me. This bracelet, a lot of times you see people that ever served or in police, fire department, whatever, they, a lot of times they wear bracelets. They have names of people they know. This is a person I did not know but I had the honor to take care of. I was in the Middle East. We were doing some, there were some operations that were going on. In 2005, and this young man, who I never met, him and his team got hit by an IED. He was the driver of an APC, which is like a tank, armored personnel carrier, got hit. Everybody got out, people, some of them got hurt and everything else. He got caught in the front. His battle buddies suffered burns because they were trying to get him out. See, that's having someone's back. That's when I say that stuff. I'm telling you, that's what it's like walking in the kingdom. Do you have the back of somebody? Are you willing to get burned and get on fire with your brother? So they sat there and they fought and they fought and they grabbed and they finally got him out. Brought him to me, brought him to our team, our unit, and we started working on him. 98% body burn. The only part that was not burned was the very top of his head. He had third degree burns all over. We knew. We already knew. He wasn't going to make it. We're taking care of his boys. They said, Doc, do what you can. Take his arms, take his legs, but keep him. No we could do. But what we did do, we promised we're going to keep him alive until he gets home and his family can say goodbye. We kept him alive for three days. Got to Europe. Family came. We were able to say goodbye. And see him take his last breath. That's why I wear this. Not because, and I don't wear this in his memory. I wear this as a reminder to me. Of what it means to be a warrior for his kingdom. What it means to be a man that's willing to say, if you say something, you're going to follow through and do it. What it means is, hey, look, if you're taking fire, I'm going to stand in the fire foxhole with you and take that fire with you. I'm going to do whatever I can to have your six. And expect nothing in return. Come on now. I don't expect anything in return. See, when he put on that uniform, just like in the kingdom, that's why I say kingdom and military to me, sometimes they line up. Because, see, we recognize each other by the spirit. Because we wear something inside our hearts, and that's called Christ. And we walk because the Spirit of God guides and leads us in spirit. Like spirits know each other. We can identify. See, he had the uniform. I could recognize the uniform he had. We get on that helicopter, and I got the two pilots, and I got the gunner over here. We're taking fire. And those two pilots, you know what I'm doing? Am I worried about them flying? They got my six. I'm working on that young man. Am I worried about, oh, are you shooting the right people? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? No, you do your job. I'm going to do my job. And as a team, we're able to build something. And that's the same principle in the kingdom. Too often we don't want, we put people at the, like arm length, and sometimes we put our foot up and say, get away from me. And that brother's sitting there going, man, I got your back, man. I'm here for you. No, I'm not going to do it for you. But I help you. That is what I'm talking about when I talk about being a battle buddy. Are you willing to go back in that burning vehicle for your brother or sister in Christ and grab them? Even though the fire is hot and it's tearing up your skin, you're going to say, I'm going to grab you and I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to lay my life down for you. That's the kingdom. That is the kingdom. Christ came and he showed us that's the kingdom. He laid his life down. Who are we not to lay our life down? 
Second story I want to share real briefly. I was able to talk to, where's my battle buddy at? Where's Tim? There he is. We were having a conversation. I was having a boo-hoo story. Oh, oh, life is so hard. Oh, oh, big baby. Oh, my big baby. Oh. (laughs) Am Am I telling the truth? Truth, bro. Huh? That's my perspective. My perspective. <laughs> he loves me. And I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I, I think back, and I'm thinking, going, because after we had our moment, I get to reflect back, and I was like, Father, you're so good. As I'm having this boo-hoo moment, whining and complaining, oh, this is hard. Oh, I feel this way. I feel this way. I, 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 I. I, I, I feel, 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 feel. Not lead, 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 lead. Hearing, 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 hearing. (laughs) Obeying, 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 obeying. It's I feel, feel, feel. Some of y'all caught up in your feelings. (sighs) I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm caught up in my feelings right now. (laughs) I'm feeling, and I was sitting there having a pity party, literally. And some of y'all there were there. I'm having a big boo-hoo pity party on myself. And now you may not agree with me, but that's what Holy Spirit said, because when I left, he said, you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself. And when you said what you said, you literally got my face. You didn't get up in my face, because I would have been like, oh, bro. No, I'm just kidding. If you you could have got up in my face. I would have been like, yo. But you got my face, you said something st- You were firm and stern in what you were saying. Not because you were sitting there going, I'm punishing you. See, this is the other thing about accountability. Accountability is not punishment. Accountability will set you free. Oh, I could have took what he said to me. Who are you? I'm old enough to be your daddy. Maybe. What are you saying? But see, he wasn't saying because he was Tim. He was saying because Holy Spirit told me to tell you this. And he, he, I, I know him. I know he heard. And because he heard, I had to hear. And I can do one of two things in that moment. I can be accountable to him and allow him to speak into my life and say, stop feeling sorry for yourself. He didn't say that, but he, he implied that. Because that's how I, as a man that's under authority, understands. When you start complaining about, man, this is hard, We all know. What are you telling me for? Man, I can't believe I feel this way. We know. We all felt that way before. Suck it up, buttercup. And so at that moment, you said that, and and it just, it stirred me. And when I left, I can hear it as I could. Man, I felt like it was, I was flashed back to my platoon chart. He said, son, you better pull up those big boy pants. Because if you don't pull those big boy pants up, I'm about to give you a spanking. <laughs> no. <laughs> Tim did not say that. If I was not clear, I got in my car. I was talking to Holy Spirit. I was like, Holy Spirit, what are you telling me? I repent, sir. We're just having fun. And so when he said that, I sat there and I reflected. And I said, man, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop being a big baby. I sent my son for you. And that son died on the cross for you so that now you can talk to me. And because you now can have a relationship with me, I choose to have a relationship with you. You're going through tough times. You don't think I see that? 
You feeling something? You feeling something sideways? Guess what? That's, that's living life on this broken earth. But this is the truth. There's a power <laughs> that I've sent you. Because now you can tap in because you can. Some, when you start feeling sorry for yourself, you start forgetting who you are. You forget who you are. You forget you are a son of the living God. And everything I have, I have given you. You have access to. See, I can tell you right now, going back to the military. Hey, when I started feeling sorry for myself, I'm start, we're taking heat rounds. It's amazing. You make a couple of calls. Next thing you know, you're like, oh, my goodness. I got the power of the whole United States military right out there. And you go, thank you, guys. <laughs> so for us, as Tim spoke in my life, see, I know I could have walked out here offended. But there was a bridge of trust. Because there's a standard. And lastly, I was transformed. Because that old man has passed away and I am this new creation. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Hallelujah. Hey, can I get another? God is good. (laughs) I had a conversation with someone that said to me, God is good. God is good. And all the time. God is good. Okay, you got a little color in you. All right. We were joking. Then in a church, you can definitely tell the difference between culture. About God is, you know, and he was telling me, he was like, yeah, you say God is good all the time. And he just comes, flows and all that. I'm like, well, see, your culture, bro, I'm just saying, come on up here, man. I'm going to pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> your Air Force. That's right. That's what happened. No, I'm jiving each other um i bring that up is is because of this because it takes all of us you know us folks that are maybe of a lot of complexion we can learn from our brothers and learn hey god is good and all the time oh see see archie god is good and all the time, I don't want to be a cheerleader, but when you speak, you speak life and death. And so when I say it, I say it all the time. Denise will tell you, I say it all the time at home. I say it to myself because it's not a reminder. I'm declaring, hey, I'm going through a tough time. God, you're good. And you know what? You're good. Not just now. You're good all the time. And not, you're not just good, you're faithful, you're, you're, you're strong, you're mighty, you're perfect, you love me, you care for me, you've done everything for me, I have access to you, I'm saved by your son, and because of that, your Holy Spirit indwells in me, the God of miracles is in my heart, and because of the miracles in me, I can speak to miracles. So when I say God is good, all the time, all the time amen. All right. <laughs> I am blessed that I had the opportunity to share with you today. And what I want to do right now is musicians come. I'm going to close with this. If you don't have a battle buddy, I want to be your battle buddy. I'm not your best friend. Don't call me about a football game. But I'm your resource. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to be your resource. And if you tell me you're going to be my battle buddy, guess what I expect from you? You're going to be my battle buddy. Don't come up here unless you're real. Because the next time I see something or say, you know, whatever, Holy Spirit puts in my heart, I know, Tim, you're my battle buddy. Bro, you need a haircut. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just throwing that out there. He looks beautiful. We do. I know, man. We got the blue going. But my point is being this. He can speak to my life. He's my buddy. 
Who in your life, who's in your circle, who's in your team, who's in your platoon that can speak truth to you and you receive it? So as they play, <laughs> he has them, thou shall receive. As they play, I'm just going to stand up here. And when you come up, you strike hands with me. You're telling, I want you to be my battle buddy. I'm going to be yours. We don't have to say anything. But if I don't see you in church next Sunday, if I don't see you in church next Sunday, 